Hi, it's Vish. Thanks for listening to Creative Control. If you'd like to support the show financially by making a monthly flexible donation to keep this podcast going, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Please consider supporting Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. Uh, They are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United, Y-E-G, for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. Ian F. Sphenonius and Rich Morell are talented musicians and creative people who have both spent time living in Washington, D.C. Ian is well regarded for his revolutionary work in bands like Nation of Ulysses, The Makeup, Weird War, Chain of the Gang, and Escapism, his role as the host of the talk show Soft Focus, and as a published author of at least three books, including the essay collections, Supernatural Strategies for Making a Rock and Roll Group, Censorship Now, and his pioneering literary debut, The Psychic Soviet, which is due to be reissued by Akashic Books. Originally from Boston, Rich Morell is a multi-instrumentalist, producer, DJ, and in-demand remix artist who has worked with the likes of Bob Mould, U.S. Girls, Cindy Lauper, Fugazi's Brendan Canty, Yoko Ono, and the Pet Shop Boys, among others, helping each of those artists and more define or redefine their music. Svenonius and Morel have teamed up as a duo called Too Much, whose new album, Club Emotion, is a danceable, synthesized rock record that is perfect for these times, no matter which one of the times you're in as I'm saying this. Club Emotion is available via the Radical Elite label, as distributed by Discord Direct. And Ian and Rich and I got together to discuss the origins of their band too much, libertarianism and quarantines, club music and the rise of the DJ as modern-day rock star, how Brendan Canty is the brains behind most of the music that we hear, the significance of lip-syncing, their future plans, and more. A part of the Entertainment One network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control and Massey Hall's concert film series live at masseyhall.com where you can stream dozens of 30 minute films for free including performances by past podcast guests like Destroyer plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts. This is the 550th episode of Creative Control, featuring the talented and thoughtful Ian F. Svenonius and Rich Morell of Too Much, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Ian. How's it going? Hello. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's good. It's nice to speak with you again. Where in the world are you? I'm in Los Angeles, California. Are you? I didn't realize that. I thought you were in Washington, D.C. for some reason. What? what why are you in Los Angeles, California? Is that where you live? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, you know, working in uh, film right now, you know, trying to land a part. Uh, there's this burgeoning film industry out here, so I decided to get in on the action. Nice. Is it, the limit. Is it anything like Bollywood? Yeah, it's a little like Bollywood, okay. but it's uh, spelled differently. Right. I'm quite familiar with Bollywood, just given my <laughs> Indian heritage. So yeah, it's nice. Nice to speak with you again. And uh, Rich Morell, are you there? I am here. Hello. Nice to speak with you, sir. Uh, we, you are, Your name has come up on this show uh, numerous times, I feel, but I, I've never actually, I don't believe we've ever 
interacted before. Is that your is that your recollection? I, yeah, I don't believe we have, but I'm I'm glad that you're talking about me. <laughs> Were your ears burning at all? Yes, U.S. girls, Brendan Canty, various people have mentioned your name to me uh, over the years. Oh, that's nice. But both of them are are superlative people, so that's nice. Nice and rich. Uh, just for record keeping, where in the world are you? Uh, right now, I'm in Lewis, Delaware, which is a small coastal town in Delaware. Nice. Is that is that where you live? I'm usually in D.C., but I have a little place out here, and we've been quarantining out here, so it's been nice to be kind of by the beach. Yes. Okay. Well, I do want to before we get uh, too far into too much. Uh, and the uh, record uh, Club of Motion, which I, I really enjoy. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, the states of the places you're in, in the grand scheme of things. Rich, what is Delaware like in terms of a mood or a tone at the moment? Well, uh, it's a very small town. It's a coastal town. So things are pretty sedate here and nothing, it seems pretty calm and people have sort of accepted what we're dealing with. And it's it doesn't seem that different than usual, except there's no there's not a lot of tourism going on. That's the main difference. Right. And for you personally, you mentioned your quarantining. How has that been for you per se? Well, in a strange way, I'm kind of built for quarantining because I, like I, it's not unusual for me to kind of isolate and work and do what I'm doing on my own anyway. So that part of it has been not much different. The difference is I is just missing people and missing shows and missing events and and that's been as difficult for me as it is for anybody. But everything else has actually been that not far off from my usual days. I I would concur with you based on my own experience, and I I will up the ante by suggesting that for whatever reason, I don't miss some of those things that you mentioned there that we should maybe be missing the social interaction, the going out to things. I just haven't had a chance to even think about it. So I don't really miss it because I'm like, I'm so busy and I'm making things and talking to people and whatever, raising my family in my house. I don't, I, it's a weird thing. Do you know where I'm coming from? Like, I don't, I'm just, I'm self-contained and doing things in a sense. Don't miss much of anything. Is that kind of where you're getting, where you were going there? Similar, but I, I, I do miss seeing uh, shows and seeing friends. That's, uh, because even if it was just sporadically, it's just a way to connect and kind of interact with people that I love and that I work with. And I, so I miss that aspect of it. So I, that's, and that's virtually the only thing that I really miss about the, the as far as the difference between quarantining and not quarantining. Okay. Cause I, you know, there's a, there's a number of bands that would be on tour right now that I would be, you know, going to see and hang out with and that, you know, not happening uh, sort of adds to a, a, a different sense of where we are just not seeing anybody yeah okay i i i'll 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 meet you i'll meet you there i i I feel that for sure uh i just haven't i guess i just haven't been dwelling on that i haven't been dwelling on what i'm missing uh just concentrating on taking everything a day at a time if that makes sense but the the other thing it's not even so much of what you're missing it's i i live here with my husband doug and it's also really odd to just basically see the same person every single day all day and not having that broken up with numerous other people that we would be hanging out with that would, you know, that that part is noticeably different. And I make fun of it every day because it starts getting a little surreal that you're, I'm interacting primarily with one other person, Yeah. you know, 24 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I think I'm slightly not thinking about that just because I think it would, to dwell on it might make me a little stir crazy and I just haven't. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Uh, Ian, similar line of lines of questioning, I, I, I suppose. How are things going for you in Los Angeles? Oh, uh, it's great. I'm, um, you know, there's like widespread looting. There's uh, army helicopters. There's Confederate monuments just thrown through the streets, rubble everywhere. There's uh, a CVS just pulled pulled out, which is makes it really easy to see what's in stock and um yeah it's it's just exciting it's it's exciting (laughs) it's an exciting place to be right now i i have been thinking about you and total chaos total chaos the music you've made the writing you've written often speaks of revolution often speaks of tumult necessary cultural socio-cultural tumult 
if I might use that word a couple of different ways and say it in a different couple of ways of pronouncing it, I guess. What what do you actually make of this? Is this the revolution you envisioned coming to pass on some level? Um, well, I think that, um, you know, it's an interesting, it's a convulsion that's obviously addressing really important things, but it doesn't seem to be really addressing a lot of uh, broader corporate and and geopolitical aspects of state oppression or state violence, you know, but uh, you know, one step, one step at a time, I guess. You, you, you know? don't, you don't feel United like it's, a, you, you feel like Does it's that make any sense. It, well, I'm asking that I was going to ask you, you don't think this is directly addressing statewide oppression? Well, state violence, well, what I mean is just the broader, you know, the mil. I mean, hopefully this will also, you know, start addressing, you know, military, you know, violence overseas and, the kind of 800 military bases that the U.S. Mm. maintains all over the world and the kind of, you know, it, right right now I'm wondering if it, there's an aspect of this that is uh, kind of libertarian, you know, defunding is a big libertarian mission because mm. like they have their own, pri- you know, like the neighborhood I live in actually, uh, you know, there's a private police force. They don't really use the police. So ri- rich people you know, already have kind of moved on past the police and they're using private police forces. So, you know, if you look at the, you know, police violence, it's, you know, about controlling poor people. And there's obviously a heavily racist as well. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the, you know, the incarceration state, I don't know, it just, it's, it's very tight, you know, tied in with, you know, just imperialism in general. And I think that hopefully, you know, the U.S. foreign wars and bombing people as, you know, as also, uh, you know, something to to address. You know, right now, Amazon and everything is, you know, they're getting on board with this. But I think that it's got to go a little, you know, it's hopefully it won't just be co-opted as a, you know, a corporate exercise and feeling good. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I do know what you're saying. Does that make any sense? It does make sense. I appreciate what you're saying. Um, similar to what Rich and I were talking about in terms of uh, isolation or social interaction uh, during this period. We had the pandemic. Uh, now there are the protests. Uh, I don't know how outgoing uh, you would normally be at this time. Has your life been quite altered by your reckoning, by everything that's happening in your country right now? It's, you know, yeah, it's definitely been altered. I mean, I think that right now, I mean, the fact that there's a huge emphasis on health and well-being and that that's become the only conversation and that everything else is kind of considered a little glib or fatuous. Hmm. And now that's extended into the uh, new focus on police violence and, you know, and state, you know, uh, it's sort of an extension of the, you know, the health concerns in a way. I think that the reason people are actually paying attention to police violence in a new way is because of everybody's sense of fra- their own fragility, right? Yeah. And also the fact that, you know, the kind of bread and circus, the kind of Roman Empire style bread and circus the Coliseum, you know, the basketball and football and all that stuff, which is usually used to channel, you know, people's, whatever their rage or their, you know, their aggression, all that's been canceled. And that's, I think that's quite significant. You know, people are now focused on injustice and it kind of, the dialogue around it sometimes resembles, it's a little uh, like a football game or something, you know? Yeah, no, that, that's a, that's an interesting. Does that make any sense? That's an, you don't have to say that every time you finish speaking. I, I think there's what a little there's a lack a, a lack of analysis. Yeah, but, <laughs> well, we're in a very fraught time, so you know it's, it's a, we're in a fraught time where um, there there's really no there's no room for deviation. Uh, there's no room for um, people to say you know anything that's off script. So I'm teetering right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I teeter and I go off script, 
I need you guys to correct me and let me know that I've said something wrong. No, no, I, I appreciate uh, your uh, sense of nuance generally, and I, I can appreciate why you might be walking on eggshells, making any kind of commentary, but uh, trust me, you know, I mean, I, I asked you to be on the show because I, 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 I value your opinions, and I think you make a lot of sense, if I might say. Uh, over oh, the years, I thought you made uh, more sense than most people. So when you say, oh, well, thanks. does that make any sense? I, I just want to, you know, get ahead of that right now and say, of course it does. Of course what you're saying makes sense. It, it'll make sense as long as it makes sense. When it doesn't make sense, Richard, Richard, I will call you out on it. But please, feel free. This is a <laughs> an open forum. You, you're welcome to chat. So, so, uh, so anyway, yes. So, so I think that for all of us, you know, we made this record, which is a disco, you know, it's like a kind of disco fied rock and roll record. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, and it's, you know, and music people, you like, it's really music that's made for being together, you know, in a space or, or enjoying in a, like, ideally, I think the most satisfying thing as a, like as a musician, you know, is when, you see the music that you've had a part in making affect people, you know, in real, you know, in real life, especially if it, like, if you hear, if you see your record being played and people are responding to it, that's, that's really satisfying in a, in a, in a different way than a live performance would be. And um, right now we're looking at a kind of, you know, the rest of the year, all of my live performances and tours have been canceled like everybody else's. I'm not, I'm not, you know, asking for uh, sympathy, but what, what we're seeing is like a world where, you know, in the near future, music is just a, um, you know, it's a private pursuit or it's, it's, it, you know, the context for music is going to be very different for a little bit. Private, and, uh, private and intangible on, on, on many levels. Yeah, I mean, like on one hand, I'm listening to a lot more music because normally I'm traveling a lot and I don't use an iPod or anything. So I'm kind of just, you know, like like it's cool because we get to listen to our record collections. And that's kind of why we like people like me amassed such enormous collections, because the idea was like, well, one day I'm going to listen to all this music, you know. And so now we have this great opportunity to really listen to music and so in a sense, you can have really deep listening, but the difference is that you don't have this kind of, you know, the context is different. It's not going to be playing at a nightclub or whatever. Yeah, I'm with you. My uh, I've been accessing my record collection more but and more. I think that music, yeah, it's really exciting. It's really fun. And a lot of the music, I'm like, wow, I really, you know, I'm just appreciating things in a different way. And it, almost in the way that you appreciate music when you're a child. Yeah. Because, you know, the, I mean, I think a lot of people have drawn a correlation to the quarantine that it's very, it feels like being a child because you have no freedom, but you have a lot of time. But at the same time, there's a lot of pressure to get something done during this time. But I don't think that a lot of people are getting that much done because time has changed and it's changed it kind of in the way that time was when you were a young person where, you know, because you didn't have agency and you didn't have the resources maybe i mean i'm speaking for myself but. well yeah it's a it's the time has become um, very open-ended as a concept now and uh yeah days are blending together um i i do want to go to rich for a moment uh here uh because ian you you invoked uh the, the music of uh too much here and uh rich uh, is it fair to say that um you had a a heavy hand in the musical production of, of this configuration uh, yes, I did the, well, before, I just want to touch on one thing Ian said, because he was talking about the record being the type of record that would be more communal, like claw in a club or, uh, with, with groups. Yeah. One of the things that has, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time doing club remixes for tons of artists and I, I always joke about it now. It's like, well, why would anybody do a remix for a club? <laughs> because the the vibe of those records is really built on a bigger extended time frame because the group moves with it i'm with the group i mean the audience in the club so those records are crafted in it with a different headset than say a pop record or a rock record that's reflecting a band's performance and that seems totally 
it's funny for me now because I see no place for it because there are no clubs. Nobody's going to the club. Yeah. No one's experiencing that kind of musical experience. And our, while our record is definitely got a, a pop center on these versions because they're not super extended, you know, dancing and the, the experience of being with somebody that you're really into on the dance floor or that vibe of what music has power to do was is fundamental to the record. And I it obviously still works at home because it was made, you know, as a, as a pop record, not as a club record. But Ian, when you were just bringing up the idea of experiencing your music in a club and not having that happen, I've been thinking about that constantly just from the the remix side where yeah that those records yeah. were built for that experience you know and it's it's just so strange that that door is closed at least temporarily but i mean anyway. music yeah it's it's funny i mean because in a sense music is always changing according to like music changes according to the technology that is that you know obviously like you know like an electric guitar you know ampl uh, uh, amplifier or a microphone and and you know, obviously, the record just the physical, you know, record and the limitations that it put on on a song length, you know, changed music a lot. And this is this is another circumstance, a social circumstance instead of a technological circumstance that's really transforming music. I mean, I I, I always think that earbuds really changed music already like the way people experience music because now people walk around with earbuds and music is able to say things that you would never want it to say out loud one of the things that it was for me really exciting about this record is that i you know i knew ian in dc and i had loved the bands he was playing in and at that time when i first met him you were he was doing chain in the gang and so the approach to this record that we had was that I would sort of come up with a groove or a general uh, vibe or feel based on stuff we had discussed and mutual things we liked and sort of vibing on the moment. But then I was able to, in the studio, make it sort of an improvisational where it would be looping and playing and I could change it. And Ian would improvise on top of it live. And, you know, we would sometimes have a 30 minute version of this song with the groove playing and I would throw in some changes to sort of follow where he was going. And then after the fact, it would be sort of, I would edit the pieces together to make the song. So it, it was because I was, I was just trying to figure out, well, how do you improvise with technology that can be freewheeling enough that somebody like Ian can riff and sing on top of it and make it feel fluid. Hmm. And that's that was what the whole, for me, that was where I was coming from on the musical side to kind of build these, beds that I could have loose enough to move around and then refine them into the finished song at the end of the mix. So Rich, what is your, like I say, your name has come up a few times on the show. Uh, it is often in the context of what I would call synthesized or electronic music. Is that primarily your musical background? Is that the kind of music you've always made or did you start out doing something different? It's always been part of it. I would say synthesize well because I was playing synthesizers, uh, some guitar, but yeah, I was electronic based. Um, although with Brendan, we did Death Fix together, which was more of a of an improvisational sort of experimental band. And, and you always, played and you played in Bob Mold's band, which is a rock. Oh band. yeah, I tour, I toured with Bob as a keyboard player and backup singer, and we did a thing called Blow Off together. We made a record together as well. Right. There's uh, a there's a chance I might have seen you perform with Bob Mold when Brent were you were you in Bob's band when Brendan was in the band? I was. Yeah, that's when I met Brendan. Oh, okay. So I I saw a show in Toronto at the uh, Mod Club. Yeah, I remember that club. That was great. Yeah, yeah. So that was a great show, and uh, yeah. So there's that. Okay, okay. Interesting. So you you you. I just am curious about the intersection between uh, Ian Sfenonius and Rich Morell on some level because I've had a sense. And Ian, please correct me if I'm wrong. I've had yes. the sense that you you have a complicated relationship with DJ culture, perhaps, or electronic music. Is that way out of left field? Do you disagree with that vehemently? What do you make of what I'm saying? No, no, no. I I, I like electronic music, and uh, or not all of it, but um, yeah, no. I'm I'm I. But I think I have a complicated relationship. To or no, I don't have a complaint. No, I just think, um, <laughs> I think that, um, you know, everything, you know, I just like, 
like I maybe you're talking about the essay that I wrote in the Psychic Soviet, my first book, yeah. which is about DJs as kind of stockbrokers. But I'm a DJ, so that was just a, a kind of a auto criticism, you know. Like a, it was, you know, once you start doing something, it makes you think about what you know what it is and the conceits that are inherent in you know whatever medium you're working in. It's you know it's always it's just interesting, you know, DJ culture, because in the, when I wrote that book in the beginning of the 21st century, it was, uh, or, you know, the first decade of the 21st century, DJs were really had become these kind of ubiquitous characters that were always, you know, you'd walk into Armani exchange and there would be a DJ, you know, or you'd, you know, there would be like a DJ at the ice cream store or something, you know, it was really weird. Yeah. And at the same time, it was right after, people's you know the stock market had become a kind of uh it had been democratized where you know everybody was a stockholder you know mm -hmm. you know it's a, a big difference you know all of a sudden you know and all of a sudden everybody had a stake in the in the market in a way that i don't think was traditional you know and uh i thought about the dj as a kind of reflection of this thing where pete where it wasn't about creating it was about designating worth or or, ex or, or, you know what I mean? Like things becoming expensive, you know, cause their whole record, you know, records that are worthless suddenly become really expensive or highly sought after, or there's other blue chip stocks that people, you know, this is more of the oldies. You're, oldies. You, so the thing about DJ is that it's like a homonym now. It refers to radio DJs. It refers to the kind of record collectors you're talking about. Maybe uh, people who spin at parties uh, in electronic music and hip hop, DJ means something totally different as well. And reggae was the guy who talks that they they weren't they weren't the MC, they were the DJ. So it, it's an interesting term because there's a the reason I ask all this, and Rich, I'd appreciate your perspective on it too, because uh, there's a song on the new album called "I Want to Be a DJ." And uh, Rich, what do you think is going on on that song uh, in terms of Ian's <laughs> Ian's very impassioned performance? Uh, what do you think is going on there, Rich? Well. I, I think it's there's a it's obviously a little tongue in cheek. The interesting thing about that song was that I was doing a performance with another artist I was working with and I was doing a ballad and we I was talking to Ian and he was like, I, we should do a song that's like that, which kind of surprised me just from the other stuff we were working on. And Ian, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but that was pretty much just improvised right off the top. He just started. I think the whole first open of it is exactly what he sang the minute I started playing the piano and the thing was opening up. So yeah, yeah. It was very uh, of the moment, and it was obviously a great moment. So <laughs> it was documented. Um, but I, I take that as being both passionate and being tongue in cheek. I, I think it, it, because the performance is so on, it's there's a there's a validity to it. It's like, you know, the, the thing with comedic actors they always talk about how you have to play it straight in order for it to be funny. Like if, if you're, if you're mimicking and sort of miming it, it doesn't, it doesn't play as funny. Whereas if you actually believe it and are in it, it becomes, it becomes funny. And that song has that quality to it where it's both super real and also has a sense of humor about it. That's a, that's, fa that's fat. That's fascinating. Ian, can you add to that? Can you elaborate upon what was going on in your head as you were, I guess, semi improvising this song? Oh, um, no, no, I, 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 yeah, it was just, I think Rich summed it up perfectly. It's, okay. It's okay. Just, yeah. It's just, you know, yeah, you know, like, uh, but also, well, I mean, it is interesting because we are, you know, I don't know, you know, when you tour now, it's quite interesting because it is, uh, you know, the, the music industry is now something that's, you know, act like studied in school in a way that it didn't used to be you know so oftentimes when you know like a club like a nightclub used to be more like a black barber shop it was like a local thing it was it was a standalone business run by enthusiasts and now a lot of them are kind of more corporate chains and and the people who work in them you know took you know sound engineering or they majored in sound engineering or, you know whatever and uh so the experience of playing a club now is, you know, it's getting a little weird. 
But um, but that's not really it has nothing to do with the song. But anyway, but well, I the idea, so the sub the idea of a, a person who's like you know the this, <laughs> the idea of you know, wanting to be a, you know it's like being an, an astronaut or something. You know? Well, no, but the DJ like as a kid, as a, someone one of you was talking about uh, how we we might be because of external the external situation that we're all living through, we might be regressing a little bit into childhood and. I want to be a DJ kind of, I can see that replacing a small child's wish, the conventional wish of, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a guitar yeah. player. I want to be a rock star. We're at, I want to be a DJ now. Why wouldn't you want to be a DJ? And I think yeah. the subtext of my question is, is maybe a little trite, but Ian, you, you are known as someone who played in, in rock bands, live bands, live instrumentation uh and i feel like there there has been a shift away from this in the recent decades but there used to be real disdain for people who didn't play their instruments but still had this superstar aura uh you know whether it was sampling other people's work uh and presenting it as something new in their own or in our case now you know you mentioned live music is different some people still show up in a van with a van full of gear. Some people show up with like a little backpack and their records and maybe some kind of mixer. That's interesting. And I, I guess I was just trying to figure out whether you, Ian, in particular, had some conflict between those two ideas of what it means to express oneself originally. Um, does that make any sense as a, as a sort of a thought process on my part? Well, I think that, um, yeah, that was, maybe there was a, like, you know, the rock, you know, at one point there was a, you know, the rock people wanted to protect their hard won, you know, virtue, you know, the, that they were virtuous. So, you know, just like any, anything, you know, like, you know, just like, or jazz musicians or who, you know, musicians, you know, wanted to protect their kind of, you know, citadel, but. Um, Areas think, of expertise even, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I think everybody's gotten over that. Yeah, so. okay. <laughs> I think that's I think, that's fair, I, yeah. I mean, I was never a musician, so, I mean, in that sense, so I never had that thing. I mean, I think for both me and Rich, both of us play, you know, like, you know, electrified live music and, um, you know, this, and I've also made electronic music before this, and I think that both of us, you know, it's just, what well, does it work or not, and does it feel... Like, you know, I mean, like DJ stuff, it, you know, I mean, if you really think about their beginnings of rock and roll, a lot of people sang along to their records in, you know, in the fifties. Yeah, sure. So, so it's, and, and obviously hip hop is all from Jamaican DJ culture, which was also people talking over records, you know, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's sort of like, it's got a very storied history. It's not, it's no, you know. I maybe, yeah. I was never like a that kind of person. There's that uh, part in the in the Andy Warhol book, Ian Popism, where he talks about going to the shows in the the sixties, like those package shows that would roll into the Apollo and into New York, and that when the performers sang to the track, the audience liked it better. Oh than, yeah, because it was exactly like the record. And yes. they would sing to the band. And this is like Andy's commentary on it. He's like, they always liked when they did it to the track. They were totally pumped and psyched. Otherwise, they were like, oh, it's OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a that's a familiarity thing as well. Uh, people want the thing to sound like the thing. The replication has to be replicated exactly more so than something more improvised, if you will, or something in the moment. That's weird. Yes. Exactly. But that's in a way those performances, which I think what you were alluding to even are sort of they were doing what people are doing with samplers and computers and machines now. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It was just a simpler, simpler way to get the show across. So, yeah. So, Rich, in your own travels, have you found a distinction to be made uh, similar to the ones we I uh, was trying to make w with Ian? Did you find that one uh, form of expression in terms of the music you've made was taken more seriously than another in any way? Well, I'm not sure if I've ever been taken seriously, but you know, <laughs> but the, the, one, the one thing I will say is that playing in bands, you know, whether I was touring with Bob or the full band I was doing with Brendan or the band that I that I was in, is easier 
than when you start incorporating electronics and if you're playing with electronics. People always think it's the other way around, but if, you, if you're gonna deliver a performance that's gonna really resonate and move, whether you're just the vocalist or whether your other musicians embellishing stuff that is on track or on tape, I would argue that it's more difficult to do that when you're locked to a timepiece like a computer. Hmm. Whereas when you're playing with a band, you have a lot of room to screw up too, because if you miss a verse, everybody just follows you. Or you, There's all these other factors that happened when you have a band that when you're playing to a track becomes sort of confining. And so when you see a, 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 a track show that really delivers, you know, that just totally knocks it out of the park, hats off. Those people that the artist that can deliver that is a whole other type of performer and communicator. I, Especially I, because if you don't have live drums, it's like so hard to kind of like, you know, like the energy, you really have to bring so much more energy. If absolutely. You, if you don't have live, you know, live, live, drum, like, yeah, the, the, just the visceral thing of like drums pushing air around is mm. like something that everybody's reacting to, even if they don't, you know, know, know it. Whereas uh, canned sound is like it's 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 much harder. Yeah, and also Ian, it's it's harder for you perform like performing to a canned sound as the singer is different. Oh, yeah. than performing to it. a drummer just sort you've got another human being there and you're kind of responding. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I would I would even go farther to say that lip syncing is the hardest performance that anyone can do because if I mean if you try it, it's like much easier to sing your song than lip syncing. What are you basing that on? Have you spent a lot of time trying to lip sync? Well, I did the, these, I did a series of shows. Uh, they were, it was called club lip sync and I would, uh, Oh, I have just bands perform their own music. You did. I don't know when, when, where did you do this? I don't remember hearing about it. I did in, uh, DC and Los Angeles, Oh, but, in, but, um, but anyway, it was, um, <laughs> it was really, uh, interesting because it's so unsatisfying to lip sync and so difficult <laughs> it's sometimes i look at music videos that i used to watch a lot and i can't believe like if i was an alien coming to earth and was told that people musicians you know spent a day just lip syncing to their own song i would have such a hard time understanding why this was done why this was condoned don't you think it's absurd no i think it's I mean, it's. I just read this Pasolini interview where he's talking about um, dubbing actors' voices because that was the Italian convention. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there was some, you know, meeting of filmmakers in the, you know, late '60s where they decided that they were, you know, you know, because back then people would make, you know, dicta, you know, dictums, you know. The, well, now this is the like, so this association of filmmakers made this pronouncement that they wanted that they thought live sound was going to be better and Pasolini was like no I'm a ne I'm a neorealist but I'm not a naturalist okay and he drew a distinction and he said that sometimes the greatest performance like that he preferred to use other people's voices you know like to dub another non-actor's voice onto a non-actor for example and stuff like that and I think there's something about a fake like a lip sync like there's something magical about a lip sync it really is cool have you uh ian or rich have you seen this uh actress sarah cooper uh pretending to be donald trump yes yes N no it's uh, hysterical it, it's it's remarkable and she's she's a she was a lesser known actor until i would say three or four weeks ago uh a struggling actress and she just started posting these tweeting primarily these videos ian of her taking Donald Trump's speeches and acting them out. And it's hard to, as Rich says, they're very funny. It's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly why they're so brilliant, but they just are. She just animates him and the scenes in such a way uh, that I, I, it's, it's a, and it's a lip sync. So I will, I will walk back what I was saying earlier about how stupid lip syncing is and point you to Sarah Cooper because she uh, is incredible. Yeah, there's something about the microphone voice over. Uh, I don't. Yeah, it's just cool. Yeah, I'll send you. Cool. I'll send you a link to one of her tweets if you want, and then you can follow along with us there. Uh, Rich, I want to ask about the formation of of too much. Um, 
because we've talked about lots of different things, but I feel like we didn't really get to that. How do you know Ian, and and how did the idea for this uh, configuration come about? Well, living in D.C. and playing with Brendan in D.C., I met Ian through uh, Brendan Canty. Um, and we would go and I had seen him perform. I think the, Ian, the first time I saw you was you were doing Weird War and then it was Chain and the Gang. And I, I was a fan of Ian's performances. Uh, so I had I kept sort of telling him that we should really do some stuff together. And I was so persistent that eventually he just relented. He was like, okay, we'll do something. Hmm. <laughs> That's pretty much how it happened. I sort of stalked him. And, uh, cause in my head, I just, I, I was so into what he was doing on stage when I was seeing the shows that I just thought, Oh, this will be a, this will work. This will be really great. And it did. It was exciting and it worked out. Okay. And Rich was also doing another group called, um, sister midnight kind of, uh, at the same time as we started doing the too much thing. And that was also really cool and exciting, it's kind of similar format, but more based on covers, like cover a lot of cover versions of songs. And it was what, really what, would, really what would you cover? Well, we covered, well, we actually covered Sister Midnight and we covered, um, it's not called Fire. What's in the Jimi Hendrix song where he says, let me stand next to your fire. What's the name of that song? It's called Fire. Yeah, yeah Fire. It is called Fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some reason I, I, we played it. I, I, I never got the name of it right. Um, so <laughs> we did um, we did a couple covers, a couple originals. It was a, with a, a drag performer, uh, Jason Barnes from DC, uh-huh. who's was and he could, he was really singing. All the vocals were live. It wasn't lip syncing, but he was a really dynamic performer, which is why I started working with him. And those those shows were great. And he just was one of those people that would deliver a, a performance. Um, but anyway, okay. So, so something rich, you, you see people in the world performing, uh, doing their thing on stage. And then you think I got to work with this person somewhere down the line. That's not all the time. Yeah. Sometimes. (laughs) Um, yeah. Well, if it's somebody, if it's an artist that I, I think is really doing something that I, I could contribute to, or that there would be a good collaboration. Yes. Uh, and a lot of work I do is collaborative. I, you know, including us girls where I collaborate with Meg mm-hmm. and I really love collaboration. I think that it, it makes everybody better if it's the right collaboration, like what you do becomes better and what it elevates what they do and they elevate what you do. So whenever there's, if I'm spotting somebody who I'm like, wow, I really want to collaborate with them. I reach out to them. Yes. So, and based in DC, you, you, on some level, you're doing a lot of, I'm guessing some long distance collaboration. Yeah. Well, with Meg, Meg's in Toronto from us girls. And uh, when we would write together, she would come down to DC and we'd work at my place and write and then um, take stuff from there. Okay. Uh, Meg Meg has become a a friend of mine. We, we just, my family and I moved away from Ontario uh, in the last few months. So I'm in Edmonton, Alberta now. Uh, Okay. Yeah. But Meg and I and Max, we, we, yeah, we're all pretty tight on some level. So, uh, and I'm a big fan of of her and and your work. Your contributions uh, to her uh, records are uh, are really amazing. And I'm I'm glad. Like, it was weird. I would hear your like I said, Rich, and I don't want to gush here, but I would hear your name through Brendan and other people. And then it just I gradually I feel like I've gotten to know your your sound a little bit. And that's what's kind of nice about too much is like I'm like oh yeah that's I can see that's Rich a little bit. Does that make does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, basically, yeah, because I mean, most musicians have one or two tricks. So once you spot them, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even Smoke, Smokey Robinson, you know, I was just listening to a song, you know, done by, you know, somebody else. And I was like, this has got to be Smokey. Hmm. You can tell. And, uh, yeah. And, and yeah, it was definitely written by Smokey Robinson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, uh, Ian, uh, uh, you, you, you are uh, approached by Rich uh, to, to perform. How does that make you feel, Ian? That you're you're just doing your thing, and this guy thinks we should do something together. Did you put him off? Were you like, "Hey, take it easy, buddy. I know what I'm doing." No, no, no. no. I know. I was uh, I was absolutely receptive, but I'm just I slow moving, so it took a long time. You're yeah, I understand. There is some folklore around too much uh, uh, based on a song called "Patent Leather." Uh, the biographical information suggests that "Patent Leather" took over the world upon its release, and uh, I had not heard this story before. Uh, Ian, what is the story behind the 
remarkable stratospheric su- success of the song Patent Leather. Well, Patent, yeah, I mean, just because you're not aware of its extraordinary, you know, that success and the way it resonated, you know, in a lot of communities doesn't mean that it didn't, you know, and me neither, you know, just because it seems obscure to me doesn't mean that somewhere it's not a number one as it deserves to be. Wait, wait a minute. No, you're, you're saying it's not only I that am oblivious and ignorant to its success. It, it could be that you too, uh, one of the creators yeah, of the song, exactly. might not be aware of how successful it really is. Well, I guess, you know, we're, we're, right now we're living in a world of many realities, you know, and, uh, you know, you look at your social media and you're just being barraged by, you know, whatever, the, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, monolithic message that's being pounded into your skull every second of the day. And, uh, but for somebody else, it might be something completely different. In fact, it might be, you know, something quite scary. Okay. All right. Rich, is there a lot of live instrumentation on, uh, this, this record, uh, club emotion? I was thinking of lay it on the line and the horn parts really, uh, kind of stick with me, but I don't know if those are real per se, uh, if you will, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, all of the, all of the instrumentation is playing like the guitars, uh, the keyboards, uh, the horns, um, uh, were, I played the, the horns, but they were actually like a played horn with a, a friend of mine, um, who has a, a horn group called Pinky's horn group. He overdubbed like a trumpet line on it, but I see the group of horn players that I know. So you, you are a multi-instrumentalist, Rich. There's no doubt about it. You, you can play almost anything. Yeah, the, my my weak spot was drums, but I'm actually one of the things I've been doing in quarantining is playing drums, like actual a drum kit. I've been programming drums, I think, like since I was born. But um, since now actually, since you were born, you you I, came out programming drums. I out programming drum beats. I was like, I got to program some drum beats, and that was pre drum machine. But I was still like, I knew I had to do that. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. So I have a little drum kit, and you, one thing about DC, if you play, and Ian, you you can attest to this. A lot of the guys in DC, they play every instrument. Like anybody, like Brendan plays. Brendan, who's a great musician who I do death picks with, can play everything. So it always bugged me that I couldn't play drums. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to learn how to play drums. So that's been one of the things I've been doing was playing drums. But other, guitar and keyboards, yeah, that's that's stuff I can play. It's, it's something of a, for those of us who follow Fugazi, I mean, Brendan has written many guitar parts in that band uh, beyond being known as the, the drummer, the guy with the bell. Uh, he has written uh, some guitar parts and instrumental uh, parts. Oh, yeah. of, I think he wrote most of the, most of the yeah, music yeah. and most of the, lyri- most of the lyrics. Yeah. I, basically Brendan is yeah. the, the true brain trust there of, uh, I, I also, I, doesn't he do all the vocals, but they, and he the does, line, yeah, he does, he does they, the vocals. Right. I think he did. I think he did the stuff for minor threat too. That's right. So Brendan did all the vocals and Guy and Ian would just <laughs> lip sync. Uh, as he was hollering behind his kit. Now, Brendan is very talented, and uh, I was also going to say, like, we just moved into a new house, and I have my drum kit here, and I'm finally, for the first time in, like, 20 years, I'm going to have a home where my drum kit gets to stay in my home, and I can play it sometimes, and I'm very excited about that. Rich, don't you find drums... Is your, is your wife excited, too? <laughs> I think so, yeah. The kids are... My kid, my son plays piano, and my daughter's just getting into... She's a great singer, we're going to have a band. I'll tell you that right oh, now. Cool. We're going to have a band at some point, I think. But if, unless they don't want to do it, and which and that's fine. They'll become accountants or whatever they want to do. I don't care. But my point is uh, drums. I think quarantine's a great time to start a cult or something. You know what I mean? Because uh, <laughs> it really is. Uh, it's a great time for... Uh, <laughs> That is both an observation and an accusation you've just levied at me. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm like a partridge family or something going on yeah. here. No, I, I just, I'm going to set them up. All I was going to rich drums are fun. Don't you find when you, you start to learn how to play the drums, it's really fun, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I do. And uh, an interesting thing, Roddy Bottom from Faith No More was, I know that sounds like a name drop, but it isn't, but he was... Uh, when I told him I was going to play drums, he said, well, you know, it's kind of like that thing where you tap your head and rub your stomach and then you switch. Yes. That is. That pretty- was the best drum lesson I ever, because then as soon as I started playing, I'm like, oh, it's exactly like that. It's, it's like weird, uh, the weird relationship of your limbs, basically. 
I, I would also suggest, and I don't want to confuse you, uh, I would suggest it's a lot like dancing. I feel like drumming is basically dancing uh, a little bit. And to, a, to a, you know, you have to be uh, precise. Does that resonate? Like, I just feel like I'm always, a, I'm kind of dancing in my seat. It does. I also, like, I find if I, the more animated I am, like the more into it I get in a way, which is sort of like dancing, like it's better for me. Yes. It's like I kind of, I can't just be, I can't do like Charlie Watts or something. Because then it doesn't really happen. No, I, I'm I'm the same. I need to just. It's not. I don't view it as gesticulating as, as some kind of like I'm trying to draw attention to myself. It just I feel looser when I'm losing myself in the drums. But this, this, don't get me wrong. I'm a terrible drummer. Oh. But <laughs> I mean, I'm just working on it. But I have a blast doing it. No, th- that's all I was getting at. It is actually fun. It's the full body workout. It's really fun to play the drums. Is all I was. Getting. Ian, have you ever played the drums? Right. Um, well, you know, drum drums are one of those things that everybody will tell you that they they can do. So you, you it doesn't matter what I say because uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I, if if you play music, there's a lot of people who say that they can play the drums, and then you discover that they maybe can't really play the drums. You know what's a weird I'm thing not, in the band? I'm, in the band, go I'm ahead. One of those people. You're one of those people in the band. <laughs> in the band, uh, Fugazi, Joe Lally actually plays all the drum parts. I don't know if you knew that. He doesn't. <laughs> It's not Brendan at all. I think we should walk back what we were saying earlier. Okay, well, this is a this was this was fun, and I feel like we got to some things. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about this new record, uh, Club Emotion? Again, I really enjoy it. Well, listen, just because you can't go to the club doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to the record. It's got, it's you can listen to it on your own or with somebody that you're not afraid of. You know. On your or, own or with somebody you're not afraid of. <laughs> or someone from, you know, a six feet distance or whatever, if you're doing that thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You could, you could amplify it to a volume that it could be heard in a room with people who are distanced. And um, so anyway, I'm just saying that just because I said that, it, you know, it's weird to, you know, make a kind of clubby record that can't be played in a club. It doesn't mean that it's unplayable. No, it's great. I have it on in my kitchen uh, when I'm cooking. And well, wait, wait. It's not for kitchens. What do you mean? That's Why not? One, that's <laughs> that's one thing, place I would I I think it really shouldn't be played. I have found that when I'm measuring ingredients and I have the the record Club Emotion on, everything's better. Everything well, t- tastes better. The, the the problem is the record has a dynamic range, and when there's you know like water boiling and you know and timers going off and you know and yeah like mung, you know mung beans simmering you don't really you're not going to hear the full dynamic range and it might not be a great place for it well that was a great review of this new record by too much i uh <laughs> hadn't thought of those things until you said all those things rich would you agree this is a good record to just be blasting around your house absolutely I, I I actually think you could play it in the kitchen, but you just have to be careful of like what you're cooking. Sure. At the time, because you could get too excited would be the other problem, and you may make stuff too spicy. For instance, that could easily happen if you were listening to this record. You're just repeating the disclaimer at the back of Funhouse by the Stooges right now, which I think is interesting. But yeah, no, I I, I agree. I, I I think people should be careful as they handle. Uh, Club Emotion by Too Much. Uh, I do think it's wonderful, and there's really good, uh, as always, Ian, the lyrics. I assume, Ian, you you wrote primarily uh, the, the lyrics here? Bre- uh, Brendan wrote most of it <laughs> from Fugazi. <laughs> right. Shout out to Brendan Canty for his excellent work uh, with the uh, lyricism here. It's really, uh, really, really interesting. Is there a, uh, by the way, where can people, uh, I know that it's out, uh, is it, uh, it's out on your label, Ian? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's called Radical Elite. Radical Elite, right? Okay, and that's the label, and it's also available via Discord Direct. It's re- it's really you know Discord's doing the heavy lifting. We're just collecting the money. Okay, well that's usually it's how a front, it's a, it's a front organization, <laughs> Radical Elite. It's like those, you know. <laughs> okay, so people can know. people can learn more about the record. I think at Discord.com is basically the subtext of what we're saying. Yeah, Discord. That's those are the people. They're the they're the ones you can rely on. Okay. Rich, if people want to learn more about you and your work, uh, either via uh, the internet generally or your social media, where would you want to send them? To find out, I, I don't... 
did, did, I guess get some back alley somewhere. They could, they, they could, like Google, they could Google Rich Morrell and that would probably send them somewhere that would tell them something. You don't have anything to sell? You don't have anything to plug beyond this? I, well, I mean, I have, I have Instagram and Facebook and stuff. You Good. can also find on both of those. Okay. The social media. Social stuff. media. Okay. Do you, do you offer your services to people like you, we were talking about Meg and and other people in terms of remixing or producing, do you, do you do that stuff? I, I do. But as I said, there's a lot like the remixing thing has sort of changed anyway, not only because of coronavirus, all of that had kind of shifted. Mm, okay. Uh, okay. People can definitely, you know, see what I'm doing and find me on either Instagram or Facebook. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, what about you, Ian? I know you don't like anything, but where would you send people <laughs> if they want to learn more about you? You're, you're Wait, often. Why? why? <laughs> Why do you say I don't like anything? Well, no, I think it's valid. I often echo and parrot uh, talking points of yours when I'm talking to people about <laughs> things like, you know, Ikea and, and oh, uh, yeah, yeah, just... Yeah. Well, you can... you can. Um, oh, well, wait. Oh, where can people find my uh, my stuff? Or just you. If, if you wanted... If people want to keep tabs on you and your doings and happenings, where would you send them? I don't know. I think there's these computer companies that collate, you know, that, you know, just... You know, they find out, you know, your buying habits and stuff. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe contact one of those. Okay. All right. Well, just <laughs> everyone should contact IBM or uh, uh, whomever. Hewlett Google. Packard. It's called Google. Google. Right? Okay. Google, Ian. Um, you're on You're on Instagram. Yeah, no, you're, no. you're often busy no, no, on the I'm, Instagram. I'm, uh, no, actually, I, I do have a, um, a reissue of my first book is coming out on Akashic Books. So that's uh, another thing that is happening, e- even in... That we can, you know, uh, yeah, that I should mention. Maybe. <laughs> well, yeah. Which book Akashic is that? Books. Which book? It's called The Psychic Soviet. The Psychic Soviet. And, and, it's, and it's more relevant than ever. The Psychic Soviet. This is what I was getting at earlier. I feel like some of the things you sort of talked about, uh, there was there now appears to have been some prescience to some of the, the things you've been talking about over the last 20, 30 years, whatever it's been. Well, thanks. I I agree. I don't know if you've caused the problems, but I you know that's the problem. You certainly identified that they might that's be coming. That's what they say about this. You know, it's like when you say things, and they it's the, the mantra idea. You know. Well, I did it. I I did it too. Every time I asked one of you guys a question, I ended it by saying, "Does that make sense to what I say? <laughs> you guys okay with what I just said? Is that all right?" If there's a song, Is everybody, <laughs> no, you have to submit it to the greater body, the kind of co- the cosmic, the 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 um the you know the yeah you have to submit it to the greater body. And there's some kind of okay. tribunal that I need to send my questions to, uh, or statements yeah. to before they can be uh, let loose into the wider world. I, I think you're right. Is there a song from? club emotion that we can play for people right now and if so um let's go to rich rich uh, would you and ian you, if you disagree please uh, intervene but rich uh what song could we play for people right now um wow let me think about this i would say you could play lay it on the line i quite what do you think, I, I, what do you think about that ian sure it's great is there a reason you chose that song rich i i alluded to it earlier because i i really love it but why did you mention why why did you think of that song rather because i i love it and because you mentioned it you planted the seed mm-hmm. and it was like a magic trick <laughs> where, you, where i didn't realize that was happening no but i it's just a song i love and it's kind of immediate and fun and yeah yeah great vocal performance too ian if i might uh send some love your oh, way thanks yeah Thank it's you. it's really cool Okay, this is Lay It on the Line by Too Much from their excellent new record, uh, Club Emotion. Uh, Ian Rich, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Vish. It's nice to, so nice to speak hey, with good, you. Good, good luck with the band. <laughs> yeah. no, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Thank you.
A very rich and enriching 550th episode of Creative Control featuring uh, Ian Sfanonius and Rich Morell. Thanks to uh, both of you. But Ian, thanks for being back on the show. And Rich, nice to meet you. I hope you enjoyed being a part of the 550th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and available on all Apple and Google platforms and other things as well. Whatever you use to consume podcasts or bootleg podcasts as the case may be i see that happening sometimes whatever you use creative control is there but if you can't find an episode that you've heard about and you're looking for and it's not on any of the things you normally use or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter please visit my website vishkana.com you can like creative control on facebook or follow the show on twitter at Vish Creative or follow me directly at Vish Kana. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. And again, uh, $6 or more a month gets you uh, access to exclusive content, including a 2011 chat with all members of the band Fugazi, uh, including... Uh, the brain trust of the band Brendan Canty. Uh, that's all at uh, patreon.com slash creative control. So go check that out. Thanks again to live at masseyhall.com, uh, which you can go to and you can watch beautifully captured concerts by great Canadian artists at live at masseyhall.com. Also, thanks to Pizza Trocadero, the bookshelf and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton for their in kind support for this show. I miss all of their products. That's the in-kind part. I don't get the products anymore, so I don't... It's sad, actually. If anyone listening from any of those places can send me a pizza in the mail or a book or a cup of coffee or a donut, that would be great. Just send me a message, and I'll let you know how you can distribute those things to me directly. I'd like to thank Jim Guthrie. Uh, He lets me use some music of his on the show, and you can learn more about Jim and his music 
at uh, jimguthrie.org. If anyone wants to send me Jim Guthrie, uh, please stick him in the mail and send him to my house, and uh, we'll hang out until he wants to go back. He's free to leave of his own volition. I just would like to see him, and I think one of you out there needs to get him, ship him to me, and then we'll hang out. That's just the way it has to work these days under the current conditions. And finally, thank you for listening to this episode featuring too much I hope you'll go to discord.com and pick up a copy of their album Club Emotion uh, it's great and uh, thanks for listening to this and, and I hope you'll check out other episodes and subscribe to the show or follow it however you want to do that and maybe tell your friends uh, that you like the show uh, you, and maybe they maybe you can have a like a book club but you can just have like a creative control podcast club where you get together in a in a living room I guess socially distanced whatever you talk about the show together and you send me notes uh, of the things, uh, just the notes that you want to see where if you think that room for improvement is necessary. Uh, I'd rather not get the praise and the adulation. It doesn't help me. But the notes, the criticism, uh, the issues you have with the show, I need those. They make me feel better. So please get together with your friends and assess creative control and then send me the report and... Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to keep making the show as it is, same quality, and uh, hopefully that does it for you. I'll talk to you very soon. Goodbye for now. <laughs>